Good morning to you, friend. This is Lee Posky. Today, I have a message for anyone who's confused about what extent Christians may be under the law. Are we Christians under the tithe? What about the Ten Commandments? I'm going to use Scripture to answer those questions for you. But before we begin, let's pray, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for giving us your perfect, holy word. And I thank you for giving your children the gift of the Holy Spirit. This way we understand your word. And I ask you to please now let your wisdom fill our hearts so that none of us walk in confusion about the matter of law and grace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, how many of you have been to a church where a poster of the Ten Commandments was hanging on a Sunday school wall? Or maybe you heard a sermon about how you're supposed to keep the Ten Commandments? Or what about keeping the Sabbath? Or perhaps keeping the tithe? Does any of that sound familiar to you? It probably does because that sort of teaching is standard fare in religion. So what, what would you think if I showed you in Scripture how that law keeping is not only wrong doctrine, but law keeping is actually the path to hell? Here in a moment, I'm going to show you exactly that. But first, I want to make this brief preface. I've studied this matter of the application of, of the law for years, and the Bible is full of clear information about this. And I could talk for hours and hours about this. But I like to keep my, my videos under 10 minutes if possible. So I'm going to be brief but direct, and hopefully I'll communicate to you what you need to know about law and grace. So let's begin. Would it surprise you to learn that much of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount was meant to demonstrate to self-righteous law keepers that they were not keeping the law like they thought they were. And would it surprise you to learn that in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, God refers to the Ten Commandments as a ministration of death and condemnation. And would it surprise you to learn that in that same chapter, He contrasts that ministration of death and condemnation with the ministration of the Spirit, in which he teaches that the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. And are you aware that the old covenant of law with the nation of Israel ended with Jesus' atoning death on the cross? Did you know that? And are you aware that Gentiles were never given the law of Moses in the first place? And are you aware that the new covenant of grace, the everlasting covenant, is actually an older covenant than the old covenant of law? Did you know that? Now let me present a question to you. Who do you suppose honors the law? Is it A, the dignified Sunday school teacher who does his or her best to follow the Ten Commandments, to be a good Christian, and to have confidence that they'll make it to heaven? Or is it B, the professing Christian who trembles at the prospect of being held to the standard of the Ten Commandments? Well, it may surprise some people to learn that person B is the one who actually honors the law. The point of the law is to not only show us God's perfect standard, but to annihilate any of our aspirations that we could ever live up to it, thus driving us to depend on God's free grace for righteousness. Nehemiah chapter 10 tells us in no uncertain terms the curse that's associated with trying to keep the law. I'm going to read you a part of it. It says this, and the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the porters, the singers, the Nethanims, and, and all they that had separated themselves from the people of the lands unto the law of God, their wives, their sons, and their daughters, every one having knowledge and having understanding. They clave to their brethren, their nobles, and entered into a curse and into an oath to walk in God's law which was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord our God, excuse me, of the Lord our Lord, and his judgments and his statutes. That's Nehemiah 10, verses 28 and 29. However, the, book, the books of Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews are the go-to references for the exposition of the function of the law. But in the interest of time, I'm only going to share highlights of scripture about this matter, and this should summarize the whole matter perfectly. This is from Galatians chapter 3. 
For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident, for the just shall live by faith. And the law is not of faith, but the man that doeth them shall live in them. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was four hundred and thirty years after, cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. For if, the, for if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more a promise. But God gave it to Abraham by promise. Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid! For if there had been a law given which could have given life, verily, righteousness should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterward be revealed. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. End of quote. Well, that's crystal clear, isn't it? And for anyone still hanging on to the idea that maybe we Christians are under the Ten Commandments, 1 Timothy chapter 1 squashes that idea says this, But we know that the law is good, if a man use it lawfully. Knowing this, get this, the law is not, I repeat, the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers, etc. You see, and these sorts of sins would fall under the Ten Commandments, and you just heard there that the law is not made for a righteous man. Well, I hope that your questions about what extent are Christians under the law were answered. And in case you missed it, Christians are under no part of the law whatsoever. We honor, honor the law by recognizing that we can't live up to it. So we rely on God's grace for righteousness. Christians are under no part of the law in any way. We Christians are justified by faith, excuse me, by grace through faith, and we walk by the leading of the indwelling Spirit of God. That's our guide. All right. Well, I thank you for listening to me. In all glory to the risen Lord Jesus Christ and no glory to us whatsoever. Bye-bye.